So, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Pavan Lal, the moderator for today's session. And our session is essentially about austerity and uh, to give you a, a quick backdrop about what we're talking on. It's uh, uh, to do with the fact that global institutions, central banks and sovereign funds have lent over the years generously. But those plans are now uh, uh, looking to delay and even renounce some of the loan payments until the global economy and uh, certain economies in specific recover thanks to what is happening with the pandemic. Uh, what that means for all sorts of businesses across the globe is how will a slowly recovering and developing commercial world be able to repay debt? Uh, specifically, for those of us who are in India, will India be facing austerity measures uh, that are essentially going to be uh, implemented by the government? Uh, on our panel today, we have, uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Devendra Agarwal, who is founder of Dexter Capital, which is a boutique investment banking firm and specializes in technology. We have uh, Mr. Chris Barkey, who runs the Barkey Company and is a medical device organization. We have Victor Gishe, who runs Gishe and Partners, which is an investment advisory that also specializes in technology. Uh, we have based in Mumbai, Mr. Varun Mathur, who is founder of Vertis Entertainment, a media rights company. And last but not the least, we have David Wu, founder of Motus Nova, which is a maker of remotely operated medical devices and robots, which uh, uh, probably would be in, in high demand in a, in a COVID world. And so without further ado, what I'm going to do is uh, toss it over to David Wu to tell us a little bit about how he sees his industry uh, and products and services being impacted in a world where uh, austerity led measures might come into force in the next couple of quarters. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pavan. Uh, and, and thank you everyone for, for joining us and for this opportunity to, uh, uh, to chat about this uh, uh, very um, uh, interesting topic, uh, something that I think even six months ago, many of us did not imagine uh, we would a uh, situation we would be in. So um, uh, kind of I can give some of the perspective from uh, how the uh, business sentiment is from from the U.S. Um, I would say that uh, from the U.S. there's a surprising uh, amount of optimism uh, and positivity um, uh, in uh, the uh, outlook for uh, both how quickly we'll recover and um, uh, how uh, uh, that we're already through the worst of it. Um, and I, I think a lot of this can be uh, the issue of coronavirus and, and the pandemic has become unexpectedly political. Uh, this influence of uh, uh, the idea of fake news uh, has really become pervasive and created mistrust of experts. And, and many individuals who have not had firsthand experience uh, with the unfortunately dire consequences of coronavirus are, are really not taking it seriously. Um, and m many people believe in this this V-shaped recovery that that will take uh, that will be very quickly to uh uh, kind of bring back uh, pre-COVID times without the idea of, of austerity. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we have we're very fortunate um, that uh, there is a, a virtually unlimited amount of government bar uh, borrowing that, that that can be done through through fiscal and uh, financial policies, um, and and so that uh, I think that the the outlook is 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 positive. Um, some of it uh, very misguided. Um, and uh, I think part of that is also uh, large parts of the economy have, have not been uh, uh, very hit very hard with a shift to uh, a lot of highly skilled service based economy jobs. That, meant, that means that much of the productivity can continue uh, with the aid of technology. Um, and, and one example is kind of what we're doing with uh, uh, skilled clinicians that are uh, able to continue uh, physically treating uh uh, they're uh, doing phys physiotherapy or physical therapy with their patients uh, with the aid, aid of technology and of, uh, of robots uh, uh, that we produce. So uh, I, I think that uh, from, from this side um, of, of the, uh, the world, um, a, a very positive outlook um, and, and maybe, you know, for the better, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, the, the downturn is, is based on uh, consumer sentiment. If, if consumers are willing to spend and get out there, um, then, then sometimes that actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, let me jump to you, Devendra, since you are working in uh, a field which oversees mergers and acquisitions and you directly deal with banks and uh, you are aware of how the liquidity system is uh, developing in India. How do you see the road ahead, especially with uh, uh, you know the pressure on the banks and on stressed assets and the, the cloud of austerity looming? What does that mean for large businesses and, and your industry specifically? Thanks, Varun. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks all for joining us. Uh, so uh, I'm Devin, founder of Dexter Capital. I primarily deal with businesses which are looking to raise capital or looking to M&A. Uh, I think the, the whole COVID is leading to a confidence crisis among the businesses. Confidence crisis in the sense that uh, businesses which want to raise capital would find it difficult to raise capital. And, and investors who are looking to invest, they will find that assets are really impaired. Uh, the the companies which which were investable may not have demand. Uh, so overall, overall there is a confidence crisis in both sides. People who are who are looking to uh, uh, get the capital, as well as the people who are who are looking to invest. And I think I think to ensure that crisis really does not really sort of impact too much, uh, both sides need to come together, including government also need to assist uh, build the confidence because. The confidence go down, the whole cycle sort of really breaks. And I think governments are already doing it. Uh, Indian government that way has much limited capacity compared to a government like US, which can which can print the money, which can uh, which can sort of let's say uh, do huge infusion of liquidity. Uh, but but there are multiple things governments can do by ensuring that banks can lend at cheaper rate uh, or or making the process easier. Some of the steps are being done. I would say some of the steps are still being still being done. Government can still take more measures on taxation side, more policy uh, friendly side. But again, government has their own constraint. So I think that part of uh, that part is sort of being done. Uh, and overall, I think uh, each government across the world is trying to take different different measures uh, with respect to their own own ability to help businesses. So I think governments are very, very sensitive to business needs and they're trying to help the businesses as much as possible. But I agree it will take some bit of time for for this whole perception being created, hey, crisis behind us and we can try to do things back to pre-COVID days. So Chris, you know, we've had a situation in India where the government has announced some fiscal stimulus uh, a few weeks ago. They put a cap at a certain number and that involves a variety of different uh, measures to stimulate the economy. It's not exactly like how the Americans have done it, which is essentially in America, they put several hundred dollars in everybody's pocket and that then increases the ability to spend. Uh, now, across the world, global economies have pumped in. I think the number is close to six trillion dollars of extra infusion into the system. So some of that is going to trickle everywhere. It will trickle into Germany and Spain and Switzerland and, and consequently India. And we will see the, the net result of that. Uh, however, how do you see the the whole uh, the concept of austerity measures and the 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 other twin concept of uh, uh, easing liquidity play out in your country and for your industry specifically? Because your technologies are closely tied into insurance, they're tied into the healthcare system, uh, and there's probably a different set of demand pressures working over there. Thanks, Pavan, and thanks to all my co-speakers. Really honored and delighted to be here with you. Um, yeah, I'm in Germany, as you said, Pavan, and I'm the CEO and shareholder of a German company, mid-size, uh, in dedicated only to um, cell thawing, and we are uh, well embedded in cancer treatment um, therapies as well. So for us, first of all, we have to say, as we have also a business in India, is uh, export business went down 20 to 30% in uh, selective countries instantly. And um, that was um, kind of a pain point for us as well. Um, the money you're talking about, Pavan, especially in the United States, this was a remarkable, David might say more about this later on, uh, the, so to say CARES Act was a um, multi-billion of dollars pumped into the system and um, money was mainly used for COVID. Luckily, we as Barkey could participate uh, on some of our segments uh, due to spending money on, on COVID uh, measures, but by far uh, it cannot um, resume the, the, the revenue we, we had before. And um, 
we feel that um, some countries um, put significantly money into uh, the economy, as well as for Germany, for instance, we felt only delaying tax payments, measures, and so on. So it is not the same um, strategy all over the globe, we can say, and uh, we feel that we, we, I think we can't help economy just by delaying payments. Uh, we need more measures, like Drenda said already, that uh, they are going deeper and more um, into uh, structures like uh, helping individual industries. I mean, MedTech is huge, but MedTech does not participate it, uh, all over in the same way. And there are under other industries out there which do not participate at all. So my, my advice is we need a really, really uh, deep, deep strategy about who and how and with kind of money we help here. Thank you. Uh, Victor. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, maybe you could follow along where uh, Devendra had left off and he talked about how uh, a deal flow was starting to pick up in some areas and slow down in others and that he expected some sense of normalcy once we settle down. Uh, how do you see the markets with regard to deals and mergers and acquisitions in, in your part of the world? Basically, I think in Europe, we're starting to see people who in reality, did the homework, especially those companies that have a good cash flow, they are more willing to take the risk because they, you know, and I see a lot of people understand this going to be winners and losers. And those people that is very well positioned from that in the sense that if you right now you have cash or you have the ability to borrow, then you can buy things that probably were not on the spot some months ago or whatever was the valuation strategy and so on. So you have unique conditions to make of COVID an opportunity. If you have the, 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 skill, the skill, let's say the teams and the skills and everything. Great, great, thanks. Uh, one of the industries in India that has only become recently recognized as, a, as an official sector of business is uh, Bollywood, uh, the cinema and the film industry, uh, Varun, which you are a part of. And uh, it's, it's also a, a much watched industry in recent times uh, across the world because we all know that because of social distancing, people are just not going to maybe go to cinema halls or theaters, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, right? You have uh, uh, air conditioning systems that are, are, are isolated and you have large crowds of people, several hundred people in a large room that might not be the, 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 the most uh, uh, compelling way for, for people to enjoy their time off in the months to come and what that means for entertainment has uh, tremendous implications. Why don't you tell us what is going on in your sector? Thank you, Bhavar. And uh, it's a it's an absolute delight to be speaking on this panel with uh, with all the esteemed co-speakers. Uh, I'll just add and answer this in, in three parts. I think one part is to essentially look at uh, where we are uh, as an economy in the cycle. And I think that, uh, you know, if you observe economies over a elongated period of time, especially large economies, they are essentially a part of a 10 year cycle, right? And we are in that 10 year cycle. In a 10 year cycle, you will always have uh, one major, uh, you know, downturn. And that downturn could be triggered by the 2008 financial crisis, the before that, the dot com bust. Now, COVID-19, there is always a trigger which causes correction, you know, after a few years of rapid growth. And I think in this case, uh, COVID-19, uh, none of us would have wished it upon the world, but it is uh, we've inherited this situation and now we have to deal with it. Uh, generally, large economies or stable economies have always shown the backbone to quickly find consumer sentiment, which brings them back uh, into the flow. And I think that now India as an economy is at a place where the general positivity of consumer sentiment will, while there'll be short term pain, there'll be pain over the next year, year and a half, two years. But generally, the economics the economic backbone of the country is now such that prolonged pain or prolonged austerity is not something that that uh, that we believe in, especially from the point of view that uh, consumer sentiment already seems to be turning positive in spite of the fact that, uh, you know, that it's uh, we are still in the midst of the crisis and probably uh, from compared to all over the world, we are still in the worst of it. But uh, but consumer sentiment is already turning positive to specifically answer on the point of media and entertainment. Uh, so absolutely, there is going to be massive short-term pain. The, we can already see that in the 
uh, in the drop significant drop in valuations and uh, you know on on traded companies whether they are the the exhibitors like pvr and iox uh, whether they are uh, large uh, media corporations z uh, star so the co- companies that are traded in india are obviously uh, facing the brunt of this current situation but again we see this as uh, as a short term pain because deal making in this period has actually surprisingly not slowed down and uh, there has actually been no correction at all in the in the deal values which were already being spoken about as as never before values uh, surprisingly we have seen no correction at all in deal values at all so uh, i think what is happening is that makers and and you know uh, mediums which are which could be ott platforms or satellite networks or theaters they are all seeing this as a blip which they'll have to deal with but they are not seeing this as the end of the road in any way they are already seeing what lies beyond and uh, my sense is that if we are able to uh, overcome the physical situation pain that that the situation is causing us uh, i don't see that uh, that prolonged austerity uh, you know as a as a measure flowing from central banks from central government you know from the governments uh, because consumer sentiment will be quick to bounce back and i'm sure the governments would want to support that banks would want to support that we already seen a couple of rounds of rate reductions and i i am assuming that uh given the legroom we have so we have traditionally been a been a country which is uh n- never dropped interest rates to below a certain point uh, you know unlike larger economies like the us uh so we have enough headroom there and uh, the third most important point is that uh, in a situation like covid-19 our being an underbanked country uh always tends to play to our advantage because uh, you know we are underbanked heavily underbanked even at an industrial level i mean you know a, a 2 lakh crore media entertainment sector can hardly access capital from uh, you know uh, from financial institutions in india but what that does is that in bad times uh, the resilience of our businesses of uh, because of being underbanked is significantly higher because they're not leveraged to that extent so there will be large corporations which will definitely feel the pain uh, because they're highly leveraged but a lot of our mid to uh, you know small to mid to large businesses uh, because they are poorly leveraged because of ac- poor access to capital or, or you know uh, poor lending practices that that our banks are forced to uh, follow uh, i think that will uh, in in a situation like this will come to our rescue uh, so we see this situation uh, mending itself in, in over the course of the next 12 months and becoming a lot better great thank you there's a general sense that the landscape as it continues to shift there'll be a number of large organizations that are going to either rise up to the occasion and then pivot and transform themselves in some uh, way or the other and uh, become proficient in other services or products uh, or then they face the risk of having to be much more reduced in their outlook and their scope of profitability and revenue and the growth propensity as we're already seeing happen to some extent across the world uh, airlines and uh, a number of companies are filing for bankruptcy and department stores and so on and so forth uh um, if you were to look at your own industry uh what are the potential uh, areas of of pivot or transformation that you think could could uh, be leveraged in the near future given this uh, uh, sort of environment that we are living in uh chris why don't we why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us and then you can go around and that, thank you so much and thanks for putting the question to me first because um i i i have i'm known as a travel guy uh traveling like 250 days a year all around the globe um first when covid um let's say the first measures were taken and uh, of course stopping me from traveling to conferences and all conferences became virtual which do not have the same i have to really to say do not have the same effect uh you can show scientific reports and so on but it does not work on exhibition halls and uh, therefore uh we had to shift from let's say participating on virtual conferences to uh starting our own webinar series the other thing is um that we learned to work really f- we we have something is called home office but we did not believe so much in home office uh, i mean sometimes you can do it but it was more like an extended uh, vacation but now home office is really established and something we definitely will keep on doing and gives us much more flexibility and freedom and of course um we felt we can for companies who have an established network uh they can 
nicely continue working. But for those who are startups and do not have network, they actually rely usually on, um, let's say, face-to-face -face meetings. As you know, uh, all of us, we don't know each other, but it would be a huge difference if we really have a face-to-face, -face, uh, at least a meeting or lunch or dinner together. That would buy in much more trust and, and um, confidence in each other. So this is something we can take back where we really struggle right now, and this is also for India, we have equipment which needs uh, installation qualification and operation qualification, usually on site. And we have to talk um, technical stuff through this uh, very complex uh, procedure and takes us four to five hours each. So clearly an opportunity for training and services, uh, according to Chris, across the world. Uh, David, do you want to you answer that question from your point of view? Yes, uh, th thank you for um, for that, uh, Chris. And uh, I, I would echo a lot of those sentiments here uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, I think that uh, um, for kind of the one of the bigger consequences of, of the uh, the pandemic um, is that uh, these very large firms, uh, these uh, uh, in, in the, for example, in our industry, hospitals um, that uh, essentially are able to dictate the rules of healthcare. Um, uh, are uh, being completely upended uh, by uh, by this pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. There's something about uh, uh, in the U.S. It's kind of a, a, a the inverse of what what you think would happen. But there's been a, about a one and a half million layoffs and furloughs in the healthcare industries. We're talking about nurses, uh, doctors, healthcare workers that. Uh, you would expect and in a pandemic would be needed. Um, uh, but because of so much of healthcare, um, our elective procedures, um, our, our, uh, uh, kind of these, uh, surgeries, um, that people come in for, for back pain or, 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 uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, even cosmetics and things like that. Um, in our, in our case, physical therapy, um, uh, medical care that can be delayed, um, by many are being delayed. Um, and that's having a, uh, incredible, uh, 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 impact on the revenues uh, for healthcare systems. Um, and so hospitals uh, before uh, that would never have considered technology, the aid of technology uh, uh, to, to use um, uh, in order to uh, treat their patients are, are now going to that. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We, we've, we've had our technology in about 170 clinics and hospitals uh, across the U.S. over the past decade. Um, and all of uh, they're, they're de kind of deployed into the hospital setting and used kind of face to face. And we've been trying to shift uh, hospitals and, and, and clinicians to use our technology uh, uh, in a, in a uh, remote telehealth kind of sense uh, to, to deploy it directly in the home so that they, they so that patients don't have to come in uh, to get the same care that they could get in the clinic. Uh, but because hospitals uh, and clinicians are, are so uh, uh, used to, to, to uh, treating face to face, um, they, uh, they acknowledge the advantages of offering uh, a telehealth for their patients, uh, but they continue to kind of operate um, as, as they have been for, for so long. And uh, this, this pandemic has really uh, uh, upended that and, and uh, forced a lot of uh, industries um, to uh, review kind of uh, the practices that they've been uh, uh, doing and, and hopefully uh, pick more innovative solutions, uh, technology-inspired solutions uh, that allow them to do everything that they have been uh, in a more efficient way. Thank you. Uh, Victor, yes, please go ahead. Uh, so I understood the vendor. Now, I have a point. In reality, what David is saying is that what happened with the pandemic is that we accelerated trends that were there when people were not embracing. But now, with the pandemic, most of the, of the population has been uh, forced or invited to join uh, things that they were probably trying to not to take, which was remote working, which was uh, trusting again on science, getting back to, to, to travel less, etc. Certain things that we all did that without this pandemic were not set to happen. And now this acceleration that we had in a, in a, in a, in a pill of three months, I think is going to change everything forever. In a point that we probably saved humanity two or three years and we put it everything together in three months. Okay, 
everyone leverage of that on that level of uh, of skills in terms of uh, uh, digital this business and that's a new departing point from here every everyone now is more willing to be to take uh, innovation departments of innovation that were just in the sake of uh, marketing and keeping the budget and so on it, that way mm-hmm. get involved in things that they were not set to do before because now the body is here so basically everyone is going to it, there's no there's no way back we probably i know people that will say i will never use this lack or whatever they were just looking for five or ten years try to escape that and just retire but now everyone is in so that changed the, the game forever yeah it's a flat it's level the playing field has been leveled and the advantages and disadvantages ironed out Devendra, what do you see happening in your industry in terms of uh, needing to adapt and reinvent yourself and uh, change the way you tackle deals and and give advisory to your investment companies? How how are you seeing that change? Yeah, so I think there are two three kind of impact for on that that's going that's already happening. So one is what I think each of my co panelists talk about uh, that in any industry. uh there'll be a very clear differentiator between weaker player versus stronger player because in this in this current time players which are weaker which are not able to innovate which are not able to become efficient uh they would they would face much significant challenge compared to the player which are stronger and we would see stronger players probably much more stronger maybe we'll we'll see more consolidation in the in the industry second is uh there'll be in some sectors there'll be more permanent impact like say travel let's say restaurant uh etc so we would have those kind of impact which will be much more permanent in terms of even long term sort of rise but i think the most interesting thing which i'm able to observe is lot of lot of lot of impacts were at least few years ago i'll talk about education so in education in schools were not getting not adapting to technology and suddenly given schools are completely closed i see technology company were changing schools ki hey become our clients and schools will say ki hey we don't need you now it's reverse it's schools were changing technology companies ki hey how can you help start our schools right so that we can start to teach kids how can we how can we do the, these things and that sort of thing is happening everywhere even a restaurant restaurant how can we show hey how we are doing kitchen preparation online how can we show it to school who is sitting so that 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 restaurant is able to gain more trust to the customers ki hey look our our kitchen is most hygienic so even if you come uh, you are right Now, these things will happen and these are the these are basically the technology driven changes i would say uh which will become much faster in nearly almost so so i, I would believe that uh the players which are able to adapt to you know, innovation in the usual processes both actually will do significantly better compared to the all of incumbents which were following the usual procedures great thanks so uh you know varun coming back to you to answer the question about pivots and how these economies might lead to massive changes in in your industry we all know that shooting uh, the actual cinematography and shooting of films today is next to near impossible i mean i i cannot imagine how your industry is going to uh, shoot romantic scenes with actors and actresses when social distancing is is the way uh, the world is working uh technology of course is the common denominator in everybody's industry right now but what are the pivots that that maybe you could see bollywood or hollywood leaning towards uh maybe media given that that is one industry that is receding so uh, our industry is actually a very unique case study in in what uh, has happened on the two sides of the of the industry the demand side or the consumer side as we call it and the and the supply side uh on the consumer side uh, we are in the post cheap data world uh, where uh, consumption is in fact covid 19 is if anything has been a massive booster of consumption uh, you know tv ratings are are through the roof uh, there are uh, you know and in spite of that unfortunately it's a bad time to be a broadcaster because even then you're not making money but uh, but from a demand consumer standpoint the technology breakthroughs have largely uh happened in the last 5 years and they've enabled consumers to actually consume without the consumption being disrupted by uh, by covid-19 uh but you're absolutely right the supply side has been hit very very massively uh both financially and in terms of uh, how we are dealing with the supply side and some technology pivots have taken place there also so uh, and and i'd say that those technology pivot pivots are coupled with an acceptance of a new level of content 
uh, suddenly it is okay to to have movie stars uh, conduct a show from the comfort of their homes uh, it's okay for people to submit uh, their homemade videos and and for it to be mainstream uh, entertainment which in the pre covid world would not have been acceptable uh, having said that uh, there are also other innovations that are happening for instance what a lot of the production higher end production is doing is that it's Im- uh, immediately rapidly moving out of the country right because there are countries that are faring much better than us as far as physical uh, management of the of the situation is concerned uh, you know so shoots have resumed almost all across europe uh, uk is back to uh, to shooting germany is back to shooting so a lot of our high end production is now being reworked to start shooting in those countries uh, while the consumption here uh, you know to keep feeding the consumption that's going on Uh, so so there is that degree of innovation and also i think that that technology on the supply side coupled with uh, an acceptance that uh, content doesn't need to always be uh, beautifully finished and at great quality uh, okay. but i think uh, and on the demand side uh, it's a boom okay and uh, thank you for that let me throw this question out to everybody and we can just take turns to answer this how do you look at the possible the possible looming confidence crisis which is essentially about the scarcity of money you know uh, and uh, please feel free to uh, answer uh, as you see appropriate uh, yeah i want to i, I want to jump in on that actually um so i th- i think uh, uh, from a previous comment that uh, uh you know this this uh, pandemic will separate the weak uh, from the strong players um and uh, cer- certainly that that you know there's going to be a uh, loss of uh businesses um but i i would say that uh, it's just not not just strong and weak separation there's also this idea of how much cash you have on hand is one of the the best predictors uh to to if you make it through this uh, and a- afterwards um uh being in this uh, uh incredible opportunity that where where gaps are left by those that that uh, have left the landscape that well there's a right mm-hmm. investment um but uh how much cash you had on hand um for any any uh, leader that has may have claimed to be ready and prepared for covid with cash on hand is either a very stable genius or you, or, you know someone misguided no one saw this coming it's it's really yeah. kind of like a, a game of musical chairs um mm-hmm. we were lucky um uh, to have uh just you know raise some money before um uh, all of uh, you know in the middle of last year so so we're you know in a fairly comfortable uh, place but a lot of startups um they need capital infusions every year um mm-hmm. and uh, uh it's kind of just a luck of the draw whether or not you've uh, completed your uh, uh fundraising uh pre or or uh po- you know post covid times uh, we're actually tr- trying to uh, raise cash right now so i can talk a little bit about the experience um there is a lot of dry powder uh there's a lot of money that that is looking for an investment vehicle um unlike a lot of i think previous uh economic downturns where um they're marked by a correction of us overvaluation of some kind of fundamental asset uh where there's this this this, this the consequences of that being large sums of wealth wiped off of uh, uh, a lot of uh uh bank uh you know bottom lines um there's still uh Uh, because of fed in the us has propped up the stock market so much there's still a lot of wealth looking for investment um mm-hmm. so we've had very great conversations um uh, seeing as we have a telehealth solution in our industry um that, that is booming or the demand for our product is booming um but uh with those initial conversations um we get to a point of uh investors still are old school and want a face to face meeting um and that's not possible right now so there's this this is strange kind of uh, a lot of uh, money wants to get to work um but it's not able to find uh uh uh, uh that 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 vehicle because of that that face to face that's needed and i i hope that you know investors um uh, at least for this time are comfortable moving forward um uh, with uh uh kind of what we're doing now these these virtual meetings uh um, yeah. and for those that that are able to do that i think that there's certainly a lot of opportunity um that they'll be able to to uh take advantage of that um they'll be able to some others will be left behind i think that's exactly the same challenge a lot of private equity investors see here in india as they look to deals the last mile diligence uh, is is left pending chris you were trying to say something Oh yeah I wouldn't 100% agree to what just David said uh, thank you for that uh, because we shouldn't forget about one thing um every time we're talking about healthcare we're talking about life 
and uh, telemedicine became crucial for that. Uh, David just nailed it uh, from my point of view that every time we had a delay on, let's say, any treatment, we had uh, patients which were urgently need uh, waiting for that treatment and couldn't uh, get access to this treatment. So it's there's a lot of sad stories around COVID beside the COVID patient themselves. And mm-hmm. Uh, telemedicine is one thing and the industry where David and me are in, there's a lot of going on on M&A uh, acquisitions activities and spe- specifically under COVID, it really dries out the market in terms of what's really flying under those uh, severe uh, conditions out there. And then MedTech is one of the markets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, If yeah. I can just jump in, uh, I just like to say that I think Uh, From an Indian context, uh, there are two unique things. One, we were already in the midst of an NBFC crisis when COVID hit us, right? So our uh, general availability of money has been poor and, uh, you know, as it was already tight. And I think there is going to be that lack of confidence. The other aspect is that I think this is the time for uh, banks, for lending institutions, for for, uh, governments, uh, and regulatory bodies to actually rethink. We, We talk of ourselves as services economy but we lend as a manufacturing economy, right? And and that's uh, the fundamental, uh, I think there is a fundamental difference in, in who we want to be and how we are preparing for it. Uh, I think our lending has continued to stay very traditional and is still very asset driven. Uh, and banks are conditioned because they're largely government run banks that have the capital available with them. They're still conditioned to lend that way. Uh, so I think COVID may actually be that time for us to to do that thinking and and at at a regulatory level and come back and say that that if we are going to support ourselves as a services economy, then uh, then it requires newer lending mechanisms to be in place and and maybe uh, the non banking lending sector to be reinforced and made and strengthened. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add on this particular topic? Yes, Devendra, please go ahead. So I think uh, I completely agree. Maybe we can divide in like the technology company versus the traditional company. So technology company typically are in general burn mode. Startups typically they keep burning even if they are pretty large size. We are seeing companies like Flipkart still burning money, right? So I think there what money you have in hand becomes very, very critical. Like how much runway you have, three month runway, you have six month runway, nine month runway. Because if you do not have runway, suddenly you have to take measures which are which could be catastrophic to your business. You are not able to serve the business or you need to do that. That's that's sort of one end. And and at least in India, those sectors at all are not served by banks. The banks would not touch them because you don't have collateral. You don't have any tangible assets. So the bank would not lend to you, right? So there the equity funding primarily by venture capitalists to family offices, etc. would come into play. Given that decision cycles are longer, so that would really come into play. If I talk about traditional businesses, Traditional businesses, uh, businesses which have cash obviously are probably better, but businesses which do not have cash or are leveraged uh, would, would find it difficult. And and there, what what Varun, uh, what, uh, what Varun just said uh, uh, makes pretty much sense that maybe we need alternate model of lending, right? It's not necessary that only if you are able to bring the collateral, then we'll be able to lend. Maybe you are able to lend against cash flow. Maybe you are able to lend against IP. There are a lot of things which have happened across the world which has not happened in the India, at least I'm talking about India perspective. And those things need to happen so that the confidence in the businesses that, hey, I'm not running, I'm not going to run out of six months. I would be able to find money if I need to be and continue to do the business. That's very, very critical uh, for the general general well-being of economy, because economy is in good shape with both consumer as well as supply, both sides are both together. So I think I think government probably would need to do that the way US government has done uh, pay, pay protection kind of program. Maybe let's say Indian government also need to do. Hey, anytime this COVID COVID loan has been extended, we we as a government are being providing let's say ten percent FLDs, first loss guarantee. So that so that at least at least economy is economy is running through. Uh, mm-hmm. There is there is a sense like hey, we are helping these general people. So maybe some some of those things needs to be uh, thought through. Especially given government has pretty decent forex reserve. Government still has more than five hundred billion of forex reserve. So they can do some some of those things. To utilize uh, and re, re uh, the Great. I think we're uh, almost out of time, but maybe we have time for one quick uh, wish list question, if I may. And, uh, if, you know, somebody can just come up with a brief answer as I go around. Uh, what's the one topmost economic wish list you would have of uh, policymakers for your industry in light of the austerity winds that are blowing our way? So, uh, why don't we start with David? 
Um, all right. Well, I get I get the first crack at this, I guess. Um, so the top policy wish list from um, uh, that that uh, in our industry, I think that uh, uh, there's already a large been a large capital infusion. Uh, my worry is that uh, uh, that this money is going to uh, just go to people to uh, sit around um, and, uh, uh, you know, people it's, it's going to businesses. Uh, there's employees are being paid, which is which is good, uh, but they're not being productive. And that's not sustainable in the long term. Um, I wish that uh, uh, there was a more targeted approach. Um, with with uh, the, the the funds that are coming in uh, to support kind of uh, businesses um, and and technologies that are able to uh, really help in this pandemic uh, move forward um, a lot of the old uh, uh, recalcitrant uh, uh, policies and and uh, 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 kind of ways of doing things that that have uh, been existing in uh, our industry for, for many years. So a more targeted approach uh, with with uh, the, the hammer of funding. Uh, okay. uh, All right. Funding, yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody else who'd like to add to that? We've got time for yeah, maybe two My wish list will be that hopefully we can close the gap between the real economy and the productive mm-hmm. economy in the markets somehow. <laughs> because in reality, I mean the opinion that we, we are constructing we're constructing a, a, a bubble in the long term, then basically it's going to have a bad ending. Otherwise, I don't understand certain things that we're seeing that the members made to the dot com bubble of the 2000s. And we, we've been surprised by the pandemic, but for me, the real risk is still hidden. Right. And my, the, my real risk is in the bubble because in the bubble, people really, really suffer. So my wish list is that that printing ends well, and we can keep this future debt uh, situation, future debt uh, crisis away, yeah. and it goes quite well. Maybe that we just experimenting big, or with all these central banks playing around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It ends well. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So I think we've got a couple of minutes left, and uh, I think it's time to call it a wrap. So let me say a quick thank you to everybody for making this uh, so easy on me. And thank you to everybody in our audience who's watching. I'm going to see if anybody wants to send us a quick question. Uh, a couple of comments coming in saying that bank to need, banks need to lend against rights as collateral. But uh, I don't see any other questions coming in just yet. But while we're waiting... Oh. Pavan if, I can, Pavan, if I can just use the moment to, to mm-hmm. add that comment, uh, I think uh, if we revive DFIs, uh, you know, which are uh, which are focused, developmental financial institutions that are focused, sector focused, uh, it would make uh, for a much more resilient uh, Indian economy and companies generally would find right. it a lot easier. Uh, we actually find it easier to borrow uh, against rights from uh, organizations in the US, uh, whether it's JP Morgan Chase, whether it's Aperture Media, all of those guys, then to borrow it in India. So, right, absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is clearly a time for most policymakers and governments to reset the scale in terms of how they structure their industries and their uh, regulations and use the crisis to create opportunities, as uh, you know, many famous authors have talked about and philosoph- philosophers have talked about using. I mean, the execution is what makes the difference, of course, but. Uh, As we wind down, I I think the bottom line is that if there's a positive at all in a crisis like this, it is that it it shows everybody in the world and countries across geographies that we are all suffering in the same way and that the opportunities and risks and threats that we face are pretty much the same. Nobody really has it better or worse. It's 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 a strange and sadly leveling playing field. And uh, hopefully that's a lesson that we'll take away as we move forward and move out of this pandemic, which we will in due course of time. And, uh, you know, I, for one, I'm an optimist and think that, you know, when you look back, you'll see this as a, as a period of terrific growth and learning. But uh, one hopes that broadly across governments and economies and corporations, the, the takeaway is that essentially we're all in this together. Uh, once again, thank you, everybody. And a good Thanks. luck and uh, stay safe. Thank Thanks. You, Thanks. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All safe. Thanks.